and we are officially starting now. So first of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, a virtual conference on Air's property and sustainable forest management. Today is Feb 8th, 2021. And I am very happy that uh, we, have, we are able to do this thing because we planned for it two times face to face, but at the end we decided to go virtual. And I'm very happy that we got very good response and I'm looking forward to be with you all day to get some more insight about Ayers property and sustainable forestry, not only in Georgia or in South, but also get an idea of what is happening at the national level. So again, I welcome all of you in this virtual conference. And as I just said, it's a good day as always. Now, just to give you an idea where we are coming from, so we have a total registration of 330 participants and, these, and this number does not include those folks who came to us in last two days. So keep, keep that in mind. When I break all these 330 participants into countries, I found out that we have total, total representation of people who are from 13 different countries. So I welcome all of you and I'm very glad that we got at least some international audience because based on my own experience coming from India, no, not many people write wills. So I'm glad that at least there is some awareness on these issues and I welcome all our foreign attendees. Now, if you broke, break down the data just for United States of America, all 313 participants from this country, you will find out that they are from 39 states. So which is a great news, which means that basically we are covering 80% of all the states in this country and it is and it was but obvious and that is also very obvious here on this slide that you can see that most of our participants are coming from the great state of georgia almost 20 percent but still you can see there is a big variety in terms of where our participants are coming from now uh, based on my short talk with my phd student or former phd student noah noah i just want to welcome all those folks who are joining us from western states or central states. I know eight o'clock is very early for you guys. So I really give my thanks to all of you for finding some time to joining us today in this morning. Now this is the agenda for today's uh, workshop. And as you can see, it is pretty busy uh, starting from eight o'clock all the way to five o'clock. So please stay with us, uh, enjoy this uh, conference and definitely engage yourself so as to get hold of the speakers, not only during this from eight to five, but also if you want to touch base with them, I'm sure you can find their contacts and try to make networks, try to build bridges because this problem is important and, no, but, and not a single person can solve this issue. We have to work as a team to figure it out, how to help people, how to do sustainable forestry and how to bring people and forestry together for ensuring that we are better off as a society, as a community, as a nation. Okay, so I will be done at 8.10 and then the skipper will come in and talk about Ayers property in Georgia. And before that, I want to tell you a few things which, is, which are very important that how this project came into existence and basically how everything happened the way they seem to be, right? So first of all, I, when I became a faculty member at University of Georgia, Warner School of Forestry and Natural Resources way back in October 2nd, 2013, I got a little lucky in working with John Shellhaus and Sarah Hitchener uh, because in 2014, they started working with a, pro with a project which was funded by U.S. Endowment, uh, which ran for two or three years. And since I was a new faculty member, I got very interested that uh, on the issue of race, on the issue of minority forest landowners, on the issue of forest, sustainable forestry. So then I started working with uh, John and Sarah on project to figure it out what is the interconnectedness when it comes to air's property, forestry and a lot of other things that come in between these two things. And slowly and surely I've started to figure it out that things are very complicated and they are not easy as they seem to be. So we learned a lot from those two or three years and uh, I think we did a reasonable job in terms of providing good research inputs to US endowments so that they can build upon the great work they were already doing. And that uh, project sustainable forest land retention program ended and now it is in the hands of American Forest Foundation. And I'm glad that Alicia will be here and talking about the project and also Mavis is there talking about the same project in terms of what the future look like. 
So that ended in 2016. In the meantime, we wrote a small grant proposal to SAIR, USDA SAIR, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. And they liked our proposal because uh, first of all, they never get big proposals on forestry site and plus on, they don't get much. They, at that time, they never funded much on minority forest landowners. So both two things came together. They gave us some money to do research and quite a bit of extension so as to increase participation of minority forest landowners in sustainable forestry, especially in Georgia. So that is how this project restarted. And over time, we did quite a bit of work. We, you know, Dr. Noah Guayaka was a PhD student under my, advice, under my advisement. He graduated on that project. Uh, we published so far five articles, two articles are in review and one article is in progress. We organized four workshops. Out of those two, four workshops, two were face-to-face and two were virtual. And I don't have to tell you why two workshops were virtual because everybody is living that life right now. Also, we did a lot of presentations across different platforms, virtual, face-to-face, -face, so on and so forth. We also organized a special session in recently conducted Society of American Foresters virtual conference where four or five key speakers basically shared their experience, their research outputs when it comes to AS property and sustainable uh, forest management in US South. And, more simple, and on top of that, we also developed very strong networks which are critical for solving the problem of AS property and plus on top of that to promote sustainable forestry among minority and underserved forest landowners. And personally, this project was very, very important for me because we achieved quite a bit, as you can see here, but also I developed some good friends. For example, Mark Thomas, I never knew that apart from extension, he does a lot of things in personal life, which are very exciting. So thanks, Mark, for all the help on this proposal and this project. Without your help, this would have not been possible. And that is coming straight from my heart. Okay, thank you so much. And finally, you know, when uh, we thought we are doing good work, why not we try this uh, award, which comes from University of Georgia. So we put our application packet to University of Georgia and they reviewed it for six months. And finally they said, okay, this proposal, this project is actually making an impact. And this is very creative because this is needed, especially in the state of Georgia. So finally, University of Georgia gave this pro project a creative research medal 2020. And as you know, getting anything from University of Georgia is tough. So this medal speaks a volume about our impact and what we have done when it comes to promoting sustainable forestry among minority forest landowners in the state of Georgia. Right, so why? So the next question is why we are meeting today? And the response is very simple. The goal of today's virtual workshop is to come together as a team for helping minority and other underserved forest landowners through sustainable forestry in the Southern United States and beyond. That is the goal of today's workshop, today's conference. So keep that in mind. And the objective is to share the experiences, especially coming from forest landowners who had years property and basically have gone several miles ahead, driven by self-motivation to make sure that they are able to solve this problem. So the first objective is to share the experiences. The second objective is to share the knowledge and that knowledge is basically based on all the research that we have done over three and four years. And definitely uh, to chart the future trajectories. Okay, we know the problem, we know what the research is suggesting, but how we should bring these two things together so as to make a better future for all of us. So those are three objectives of this workshop or this conference. And as you can see, there are three or four sessions. And if you observe closely, those sessions are arranged according to these objectives. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, this is the last uh, slide from my side. So if you have questions, you are most welcome to ask them using Q&A option, which is there on your webinar screen. Okay, so do not forget, do not put your questions on Q&A because that will, uh, do not put your questions on chat option because that will confuse everybody and I might miss some questions which are important and I, and I don't want to miss any question, okay? So use Q&A option for putting your questions use chat option for introducing yourself to attendees. So for example, if you want to tell about yourself to all the other folks who are attending this webinar, please go ahead and talk about in 100 words or so about yourself, what you do, how you are, why you are interested on AS property issues and so on and so forth in using chat option. 
and do not mix Q and A option and chat option just to make sure that I'm not losing information about you. And also I'm not losing your question. So do keep, try to keep these two things as separate as possible. If you are joining us today for credits, CFA credits, then do not log off even in breaks and lunch, because if you log off and try to come back, it will be very difficult for us to figure it out for how long you have attended the webinar. So stay put, just do not close your screen and I will do the same from my side, okay? Most importantly, you know, in this charge climate and political climate, I know everybody has emotions and everybody has some different set of mind, but definitely keep those things apart, be respectful and courteous, especially on this forum. And I will be observing all things very carefully. And I'm pretty sure the way things are, everything should go very smoothly. But if I see something which is, a, which is not up to the standard of University of Georgia, or at least to my standard, then I have to act. But hopefully I will not go that far and we are friends and we are trying to work together to solve this problem. So be respectful and courteous, most important, right? And for all the things, good or bad, this is my email, please touch base with me. If you need anything, if you want anything or something is not going well for you, more than happy to help as always the case is. And also one more thing I did not mention here that we are recording everything and these, recording, these recordings will be available to all of you in some time once we have uh, finished all the things. So I am assuming like almost one month from now, these recordings will be available on YouTube or somewhere else. So as to make sure that you can watch it again, you can touch base with the speakers. And most importantly, you can try to come together as a team to move forward. Now, I will not take much time. So I will introduce our next speaker. A skipper is the executive director at Georgia Airs Property Law Center. And I know Skipper because this organization came when I almost became faculty member at the same time. And I have seen how well this organization has developed over space and time. And definitely, as we all know, that leadership matters and Skipper is a great leader on those lines. And I really admire all the help that the Skipper and her organization is providing to landowners in Georgia so as to solve various property. And not only that, to tell people how to go about sustainable forestry for managing lands for not their own family, but also for future generation. So Skipper, with this, I will stop. And then um, basically I will start sharing my screen after this one. Okay. Thank you, um, Junit. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I am Skipper Steitmaus. I'm the founding executive director of the Georgia Airs Property Law Center. Um, while Punit is getting my SharePoint up, um, I will uh, share with you a little bit of my own background. I became an heirs property owner at the age of eight when my father died and my mother and six children inherited a farm in South Georgia, way down in Brooks County. And I have spent my lifetime um, since eight figuring out and addressing heirs property. I oftentimes tell folks I have an undergraduate degree in photography and drawing and moved back to Dixie, which is the name of the town I grew up in. Two miles south of Dixie is where I grew up on a farm. And when I did move back, I realized that an art degree wasn't going to cut through the um, issues that were at hand in Dixie, Georgia. Hold on just a second. If you need, I'll tell you when to forward, please. Oh, sure. um, and um, so um, that's what drove me to law school. and. Many, many years later, here I am still working on the on the uh, heirs property and uh, developing sustainable solutions in Georgia. So um, next, um, like any, we are a nonprofit law firm. Um, we provide direct legal services. Um, Puneet, I don't know if you heard me say next. Puneet, can you hear me? Yes, yes, give me a second, I think. Okay. Uh... Anyway, yeah. we are a nonprofit law firm and we provide direct legal services. And like any good law firm, I have to give you a disclaimer that I am not um, that I'm not providing legal advice today is just for educational purposes. Next, Punit. So the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center was founded in 2015, and um, we have offices in Atlanta, Athens, Fitzgerald, and Valdosta. And we work statewide with a geographic focus 
and outreach in Atlanta and South Georgia. Next. Um, so what do we do? We work in three buckets. Uh, we provide legal support for families, individuals, nonprofits, and municipalities by clearing the title or doing title consolidation, um, putting, meaning that we put it into an LLC or a um, trust. And we also um, use, we have about five different legal strategies that we use in order to help the family move forward. We very much believe in self-determination. So we work at find, um, through our intake process, identifying the goals and the opportunities for the family, um, whether it's in forestry or housing um, programs or whatever, or just simply because they want to clear the title. And then we use our five different legal strategies um, we actually have six, but I've never seen the sixth one ever used. Um, and then in order to move the family forward. Um, our second bucket we call um, heirs property prevention. And most folks call, most attorneys, all attorneys really call it estate planning. Because without the correct kind of estate planning, you can end up with heirs property. Um, there is a misnomer out there that if you have a will, that you are protected from heirs property, but that is not true. Because if you have a will that leaves all your property or your home to four of your children, you have created heirs property, at least in the state of Georgia. Um, because now all four of your children own your home or your land. So we work not only on um, providing estate planning for our clients, every client is offered an estate plan, but we also do a lot of legal education for attorneys on how to prevent um, heirs property when they are drafting wills or doing such things that seem um, like they don't relate to property like divorce agreements. We've seen heirs property created through divorces and through wills and also um, through um, uh, not having a will and then the other would be through some weird financial fi um, mortgage process where we have, for example, a client who owned, who had her, um, the property as joint tenants with right of refusal. Her, um, they re her, she and her husband refinanced at some point and it was put back in um, her husband's name and not um, in tenants in common. And then when her husband died, when there's only $5,000 owed on the property, um, she actually did not, she owned her land, her house with her stepchildren and the mortgage company wouldn't talk to her. So the mortgages are actually an important part of the work we do. Um, and then the third bucket is asset education. Um, and meaning that helping folks realize and reach the potential of their full potential to turn their land, if it's a farm or a forest, into uh, generational wealth and um, bringing in income to support them, or um, their house, if they are, if they, um, if they have um, a house, treating it like a bank book and look, bank account and looking at it as, um, an asset and how do you grow it for generational wealth. Next. Pineet, oh, okay. So since 2015, we've closed 445 matters. We've completed 181 estate plans and we've reviewed um, land uh, title searches on um, 251 pieces of land. And we've reach, done reach out similar to this are actually even a more, a little more uh, drilled down into the technical aspects of Georgia law and how it impacts home and landowners to 12,555 people. And we currently have 67 title clearing matters open and we're working in 27 counties of Georgia's 159 counties. Um, next. So this is the area that we work. Um, the or, the um, stars denote offices that we have throughout the state. And the red 
um, counties that are highlighted um, in red are where um, we have heirs property cases. And um, this, the light pink is our target area. Next. Um, so, you know, I'm oftentimes heard joking about the fact that the start of the center in 2015, and if the study that the USDA and UGA Carl Vincent Institute had done had come out earlier than 2015 and not after 2015, I might have paused because um, the study determined that there was probable heirs property in the value of over $34 billion throughout the state. Um, with an estimated of 11 to 25 percent of um, heirs property in every Georgia county. And um, this then I am particularly, um, I think it should, makes a really good point in that it in, involves all these different sectors. It not only involves the landowner, but uh, it also involves the state and federal agencies, research, Earths and public outreach, private sector, nonprofits, municipalities, and the legal community, but we all have these shared goals. So really looking across the sectors and figuring out how we can all work together. Next. So what is heirs property? It's, I'm assuming that most of you on this presentation know what it is, but I always go over it briefly um, because I have been, I've come to realize that not everyone knows it inside and out. Um, home, our land that has been passed from generation to generation in such a way that multiple people own the same piece of land. It's considered in Georgia to be tenants in common. Um, the result is fractured or tangled title. Its heirs property is created when the owner dies with the will, leaving property to multiple beneficiaries, or the owner dies without a will and is passed through in test state succession by the Georgia statute. Next. So here's an example. Mom dies. Um, the real property is co-owned by the father, the, her, her spouse, and the six children. Um, and a lot of folks assume that if um, a spouse dies, that the spouse, the other spouse is still living, inherits all the property. That is not the case in Georgia unless you have a will that specifically says so, or you have a um, joint tenants with right of survivorship, which is a particular kind of deed that did not come around until I think in the 1980s. And it, um, so it's more of a rarity than a, a normal kind of deed. Okay, next. So as you can see, it, it can multiply quickly. Mom dies, dad, and four children and six grandchildren inherit because two of the children are dead. So now we have 11 heirs. So next. What does it mean to own heirs property? Own, owners of heirs property are tenants in common. Tenants in common is a legal word. Each heir has the equal rights to full use and possession. Each heir is legally responsible for taxes and other property related expenses. Each heir may transfer interest in property to another heir or outsider. Each heir may seek a partition of the property and each heir must agree to any major decisions about the property. There are two things I wanna point out on this. One is that a lot of folks think if they pay the property taxes that they increase their legal ownership. Not true in the state of Georgia. It doesn't matter what you end up paying for that property. It does not increase your right of ownership unless you have a written legal agreement with all the rest of the heirs who also own the property. And the other part is that it is common and we have many cases that show this that um, for a family member to sell or to convey to someone outside of the outside of the family, so you can end up which air, with air property that does not include just the family and includes an outside person. Next, so why is it a problem? Individuals living on heirs' property faced an increased risk of sell and eviction. We've um, actually handled quite a few cases where we've. Um, someone was about to become homeless because um, they had been living the, in the house their entire life, but they actually didn't own it. 
so without the right legal ownership, you can um, run the risk of losing your home. Um, they cannot sell, mortgage, or lease the heir's property without the agreement of all heirs. And more difficulty, farming, qualifying for agriculture, and selling agriculture products. This includes um, trees, timber. Can't qualify for rehab programs or secure financing. Heirs may not be able to participate in government programs. Cannot qualify for loan modifications and other loss mitigation programs when facing foreclosure. And heirs may not be able to qualify for conservation use tax reductions, homestead ex exemptions, or other property tax exemptions. And we actually had one case where a woman had lived in her house for 30 years, thought she owned it because her father she had moved in to help her father transition. When she went in to apply for homestead exemption, she found out not only did she not own it, but she didn't have any legal right to it. So for that particular situation, we um, filed what's called a quiet title action and were able to secure the legal right for her to own the property. And then she was in her eighties and decided that maintaining the house was no, longer in her best interest and she sold it for $350,000. So she went from not owning it to being able to support herself in her transition years. Um, next. Um, so how does heirs property impact your woods and timber sale? Clear title enables you to participate in programs, sell timber legally for the best and best price and use best practices to manage and preserve woods and timber. For example, if an heir, which is also uh, called a tenant in common, sells timber without a formal detailed agreement with all the heirs, which are the other tenants in common, then the heir selling the timber will most likely get a lower, lower price and bit, can be and actually has stolen the timber an asset from the other heirs. Next, um, heirs property robs next generation of primaries uh, uh, means of creating wealth. When heirs have clear title, um, they can open a line of credit or apply for a mortgage. They can use the property as collateral for a loan to start a business or send their kids to college. They can generate income by leasing the property. We saw one um, client that we cleared the title for, she set up an Airbnb and she contacted us a year later and said it was the weirdest thing. She'd never had to pay property um, income taxes before, but she made so much money on that Airbnb, she had to pay income taxes. Um, they can generate, and she wouldn't have been able to lease out that property if we hadn't cleared the title for her. Um, they can generate income through forest products by farming or selling natural resources on the property, and they can sell the property, and they can also pass on the property to their family in a very intentional manner that does not create heirs property. So heirs property is the problem, clear title is the solution. Next. Um, how is heirs property created? Um, again, I think I'm repeating here. Um, you can die without a will or with a will and leaving the real property to two or more per, um, beneficiaries. It's not enough to have a will. <coughs> you must have a will that purposely prevents heirs property. Next. What prevents marketable title? Um, defective or fraudulent deeds, existing mortgage loans secured by property, liens against the property, liens against the owners, lack of access, encroachments on neighboring properties and the heirs property status. Next. Um, what can you do with clear title? You can manage your timber and sell it for the highest value, receive the maximum benefit from Georgia Forestry Commission programs, receive the maximum benefit from Georgia and agri... Um, I can't see what that word says, but I'm assuming it says forestry and agriculture programs. You can sell agriculture products produced from the land and you can take advantage of property tax reduction programs and you can pass your property on to the next generation and enter leases or contracts for the property next. Um, so how does the center help? We consult with families on the status of their property. Uh, we provide, an, um, including family meetings, and we provide direct legal representation to property owners, 
Um, and um, areas properties can be expensive and time consuming to resolve, you but fundamental to building generational wealth and transforming communities. We oftentimes hear pushback over how long it can take to resolve heirs property. Um, it took decades to create it. It's not, there's no magic wand. It's just going to take the work it takes. And also you want to do it in the most um, sensitive and um, intentional way so that you can preserve as much of the family unity and you can get as much value from the property as possible. Whether or not that value is going to maintain ownership with the um, family or, or a family member, or is that they want to um, put it on the open market. So next. Here's a client story. Um, this particular client was not able to um, participate in a CDBG home repair program down in South Georgia. And um, because we cleared her title, she was able to, but probably more interesting than anything is we created case law as we did it. This um, woman was raised by her aunt and uncle, but did not know they were her aunt and uncle. And they were not her mother and father until after her, her um, aunt and uncle had passed. And we actually got her virtually adopted through the probate court in order for her to become the only heir. And um, so what the picture you see is our staff attorney and the probate judge with the client. And um, it was pretty um, groundbreaking in Georgia because it did create new case law. No one had ever used the probate court to virtually adopt someone after the parent's death. Um, and in that process, which happens often, um, she was able to meet family members she didn't know she had, and the family members actually purchased her uh, dining room uh, set for her new house. Next. So um, clearing uh, additional client stories, clearing title to manage to preserve woods and land. Um, we have one client that, um, has heirs spanning two generations and they manage the timbers on their heirs property for the benefit of all the heirs and um, are paying some of their case costs with the sale from the timber. Um, six heirs cleared title in order to close the USDA conservation easement, which reduced the farm debt and created economic sustainability for that particular farm. So it was able to stay in the family and um, we secured the right, the center staff secured the right for an heir to buy out the 40% interest acquired by a non-family member developer of their 100 acre farm. So, uh, uh, working with the center, we have a whole intake process um, that we go through, um, folks can call us, um, what does the deed say? Who has the ownership? Which steps are required to clear the title? And how can heirs' property be prevented? Um, these are the legal strategies and the steps. I'm realizing that um, as I was talking that some of the legal strategies we use are not actually listed on here. Um, so we do a title search first to determine the condition of the title. And while we're doing the title search, we ask that the um, potential client, so we engage for the title search only because we want to figure out what, it, what exactly the title condition is. And then while that is in process, we have the heirs, um, the potential client um, fill out an heirs determination form. And then we probate the estates. We can do things like probating estates of deceased heirs drafting and filing probate petition, petitions. There's a whole legal strategy. Once we figure out the title, then we may engage for the legal strategy that we identify in order to clear the title or to consolidate it. Um, and then the up, up, ultimate goal is marketable title. Next. Preventing heirs property. I always speak about this briefly. Go ahead, um, Puneet because it is important. Um, you can own property as joint tenants with rights of survivorship in Georgia. And that, as I said, that, that type of deed was only developed in the 80s, which is 
why there aren't that many of those deeds around because property rights and ownership are very old. So we'll catch up with it eventually, maybe. You can prepare a last will and testament. Um, you, these are the different ways that um, in the last will and testament that you can use in order to prevent heirs property. We have since the creation of this slide identified a couple of more that we are very um, smitten with, um, but it gives you um, basically some options. You get, um, and then you can also put the limited, put the property into a limited liability company, what's called an LLC or a family trust. Um, you can also create um, in through the will process a limited liability company or a trust. Next. So that is it. Do you, um, any questions? Yeah, so okay. thanks, Skipper. So we have two questions in Q&A option, and I will request everybody who have their questions, just write them up in Q&A option so that we are not missing them because there's a lot of chat already on chat option. Okay, I see the questions, Pini, and um, there's not a list of heirs property owners in the US, and there's not a list of heirs property owners in Georgia even. Um, any data and information that we collect on heirs property, we consider it very confidential because we do not want to educate folks as to where vulnerable property owners are. Um, in regards to the second question, um, the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center and the fact that we are Georgia licensed attorneys, we only practice in the state of Georgia and do not, not offer our services outside of the state. Oh, okay, good to know. Okay, thanks Skipper. And also just to add to Skipper's point, a lot of uh, organizations just like uh, Skipper's organization, they work in respective states. For example, in South Carolina, uh, Ginny Stevenson, she is a good friend. She runs uh, her own nonprofit, uh, Center for Years Property and Preservation. So they are also very active uh, in this area. So if I don't know where this uh, attendee is from, but if you need help in South Carolina, definitely I will strongly recommend name of CHPP to you, and then you can take it from there. Now, Skipper, Ms. L. Wills is asking, what's the difference between LLC and trust? That's a very deep question. Um, <laughs> so a um, LLC is basically a business um, corporation that is uh, registered with the Secretary of State in Georgia, and you have an operating um, agreement, an operating uh, yeah agreement, where it spells out who's who's going, you know, what the rights of each member of the LLC are, who's paying taxes, how taxes are being collected and how the assets would ever be distributed. Um, a trust is a family trust. Um, oftentimes people get a family trust confused with a land trust. A land trust is a 501c3 nonprofit that takes a public, has to have a public uh, purpose and has to have a board of directors. A family trust is a mechanism that is created by whoever so if you, you can create a family trust as an individual, if you own the land and leave it in a trust, um, or you can have a whole bunch of family members convey their, their um, rights over to the trust in order to um, preserve it as a trust. The trust is a um, legal document. It is not registered with the Secretary of State. It is also not registered with any actual outside of the family legal entity. Um, which can lead also to sometimes abuse and sometimes a hard to understand what your rights are and how to move forward. Um, the difference, a, a trust can last something like 360 years in the state of Georgia. Um, and the if you put property into the title, uh, title in the trust, it will stay in the trust no matter who becomes heirs. Right. So thank you so much, Skipper, for your time and for a really nice talk. I appreciate that. I think in the interest of time, there are some questions that we cannot take live. But Skipper, if you have time, just there are short questions anyways. If you can type one or two keywords just to help people out, that will be really appreciated. Right. OK, so one speaker done. Now we have our second speaker who is a giant when it comes to 
Ears Property and Sustainable Forestry. And I'm very glad that Mr. Joe Hamilton is going to speak about his own experience and his own motivations when it comes to solving Ears Property. And uh, this being said, Joe, you are there. We talked in the morning. Uh, I don't see you on, okay. So Joe, you are all set. You can uh, go live at the biggest screen if you want to share some something at your end. Okay, I see Skipper's picture is still there. Um, uh, that, no, no, okay, I, there we go. That is that wasn't me. That was Skipper. Uh, a, a couple of things that Skipper said just now. And that's a very unique name, Skipper. You may have to enlighten us on that sometimes. <laughs> but uh, there, there, there's a couple of things that she uh, pointed out that is exactly what I went through. I, I went through that very same steps, step by step, without the professional help, of course. We went to the Center for Airs Property Preservation and we were able to get our family members into the same room and that was an accomplishment right there. And one of the things that um, in doing the research to clear this title and I did from 2007 to 2010, during that process of time, I, whenever I give this talk, most people would ask, well, what was the most challenging time for you? Or what pre presented the most challenge? Family members. Strangely enough, it's, it's, it's family members. Within that family unit, you're going to find people jostling and posturing and this sort of thing here. And uh, it, it is it's unbelievable sometimes, but, uh, but we were able to persevere. 2007 to 2010, we were able to get it done. Whenever I do these talks, we, uh, we look for three things we'd like to try to convey to enlighten the group and hope the group will become enthused by what they're hearing and empowered to go forth and do something about it. I am, first of all, excited that this many people are viewing this right now. Thank you. I've seen some of you uh, acknowledging in the chat that you're here. Thank you for being here. This was quite, quite laborious and, um, and a challenge. And it is a challenge even today in, an, in such an enlightened society we're in you know, what, what the land that I am sitting on right now, I hope to be able to share with you as we move forward with this, is, uh, is highly prized. It's, it's sitting between two very large plantations. And in fact, I will, let, me, let me just back up. When I typically do this, I usually come from the time of Christopher Columbus sailing to America and the Lord proprietor settling in Charlestown or Charleston, South Carolina, and begin to migrate south and into towards Florida. And as a result of that, as a result of that migration, they encountered, of course, Native Americans, the Cherokee, and there is a town not too terribly far from me, it's called Yamasee, South Carolina. There's a Yamasee Indian and Indians, and then the, uh, what is particularly interesting to me is the Kosabo Indians. And there's a plantation adjoining where I, my property is located. The name of that plantation is Po Kosabo. And I, 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 traced, I traced the origin of that name to the Kosabo Indians who put a, a pretty fierce resistance to the settlers. But, uh, but, I, but, but they persevered and they moved forward. And, and of course, we are here today. But uh, one of the things that I would, I'm gonna skip forward real fast because a good bit of my time is gone already. But uh, uh, again, not only that, we want to, we're, we're taking about a two or three hour uh, presentation and condensing it into our 30 minutes here. Now a little less than 30 minutes. So, so if, if, if we would look back, and again, before I get into my story, let me just, just share with you just a couple of things. Uh, you know, in, in, in 1861, in January, 1861, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the, the Star of the West is a civilian ship was sailing to, into the harbor, Charleston, South Carolina Harbor, to replenish Fort Sumter, which was uh, under United States control. Well, unbeknownst to the sailors on the, on the Star of the West, on Morris Island, there were some cadets there from a, the, 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 this, this military college which, has now named, which is now named the Citadel Military College of South Carolina. They fired onto the Star of the West, a shot of the bow and missed, of course, because it was a shot of the bow. The second shot is reported that hit the ship and splintered off the ship. And because it was a civilian ship, they were not war fighters. They turned around and sailed back. So technically that was the first shot 
in the Civil War. And this started the Civil War. And of course, 18, April, the Civil War started. In April 1865, the Civil War, all cessation, all fighting ended. And again, today, we are approaching April of 2021, almost 160 years later, there are still factions of the Civil War going on. Strangely enough, there are still factions of the Civil War going on. And, and, and prior to the, the cessation, cessation of, of fighting in April of 1865, uh, a group of uh, ministers in, in January of 1865 met with uh, Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln. His name was Edwin Stanton, and also he had a recorder with him. It is also reported that General William Tecumseh Sherman was present. And one of the things that General Sherman has it, been the four long, brutal years, he is now tired of this fighting. In fact, some of the people he's fighting against is were classmates of his. He actually attended the academy with some of those same people. So when we think of the Civil War and we think of, a, okay, the, the flag is up for some people that says heritage, not hate, and this kind of thing here. And when we think about all of that, we need to set this aside, set this aside and say, you know, what really prompted this thing? And it's been 160 years. You know, I think it's about time for us to move on. But again, and, I, and I'll share with you a quick story before I get into my story, but back to the ministers who met with uh, Sherman and Stanton, they met in Savannah, Georgia. And, and at this time, whenever I, I see this, I can, I can see Sherman standing up. He's, he's actually frustrated because he's not a lover of slaves. He, he's a war fighter. And at one point, once he, as he was moving through Georgia in route to South Carolina, because South Carolina was the first to secede and he was en route to South Carolina to punish South Carolina. And, and as he was coming to Georgia and, 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 and decimating the plantations there, um, uh, many of the slaves are now freed. They have nowhere to go. So they are following him. And, and Sherman, when, when he's ready to bivouac for the evening with his troops, he's, what, what, what are these slaves following me for? So he's not exactly excited about this. And so now as he meets in, in, in Savannah, Georgia, one gentleman, Garrison Frazier, who purchased his freedom for $1,000 with silver and gold for him and his wife, he is a spokesman for the 20 or so people. And, and he's talking to Sherman, and Sherman, apparently, I see him abruptly interrupting Garrison Frazier. He said, what do you want? If you receive your freedom as a slave, you've been told what to do, when to do, how to do. And if you receive your freedom, what would you do? But what, 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 what Sherman did not realize, that these slaves, these Africans, were, 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 were people of the land. They were one with the land. They understand the land. It, it's signature in one of my emails is that we are like the tree, our roots run deep into the land. And so the garrison Frazier said to uh, Sherman and Stanton and the recorder, land. If we have land, we can take that land and produce, we can work it, we can develop it, and we can make it productive, and we will acquire other lands. What, he, what, what Sherman did not, what Sherman expected was a, 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 a person who's been a slave for, for, for an X number of years and now has been submissive. And this, what he did not consider, the fire in the belly, as the General Colin Powell would say, as the fire in the belly in this Africans the same fire that existed in Harriet Tubman. To walk not very far from where I am right now, Harriet Tubman have traveled in this very same area. So that fire in the belly is there. And my wife and I, of 43 years, actually, we did the very same thing Garrison Frazier did. Once we settled our ears popping, I will get to sharing that with you in the shortly, in shortly, is that we were able to acquire additional lands and we cleared it and we planted it. And is now, I am 6'2". And we planted this in 2016. There are trees in there over 15 feet tall because we are a people of the land. We connect with the land. We are earthly people. One day we'll leave this earth. We are only here for a period of time. We're merely stewards. And once we leave this place, we will return to the earth. We know that. 
I know that. I don't expect, I don't own all of these things. I am merely loaned these things. But anyway, as, as, as uh, General Sherman, when he asked the, uh, uh, Garrison Frazier or asked the, 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 the contingent that was meeting with him, he said, just give us land. Provide land to us and we will take off from there. And not only that, our young men will serve in your armed forces. We will give back. Most people at some time, one time or another, will think, well, you know, this is a, this is a freebie, gimme type of thing. No, no, it's not. No, no, we, we, we're people of the land. And let me share you with that story. We went to the, the American Forest Foundation, had a session in Baltimore, and I serve on the uh, Woodland Operating Committee for that foundation. And uh, we had a session up there, and a couple of young ladies when one of the breakout sessions was discussing heirs' property. So I went there and they did a brilliant job. And another man, uh, a man uh, another um, a, attendee sitting right next to my, uh, my right, I could see he was somewhat discomforted. And this is no reflection on that state or this person. I'm not even going to call his name. But the point of it is, is that when, when we left, we went to, the, to, to a refreshment part and then going to another session. And 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 and, uh, and 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 we, we I could see he wanted to talk, but you know I'm standing at six two, I'm about two hundred thirty pounds. This guy's about five five, maybe one eighty or so. So he's he's thinking, my God, I'm, how do I ask this this man about this? And so I so I wanted him to be a cousin. But how did you feel about that? What what were your thoughts on this? And he said, well, you know, um, I I I think that's interesting, but uh, but you know I I know I know some white people who could use that. When you were talking about the NRCS and the EQIP program and the, and this, uh, the SSLR, the Sustainable Forestry Land Retention Program, and this sort of thing here. So, so and, and the two young ladies did a brilliant expose on that. And I said, well, you know, I, I let him ask his question to me. And, and he said, you know, you know, there are white people. I said, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. I said, I agree with you. But let me share with you a quick little snapshot. I said, you know, my son, I have three children, three adult children, all three are grown and three are college educated. But my son, who's the oldest, he at the time <clears throat> was, was the commanding officer of a United States Navy ship. And he graduated from the Citadel, the same school that fired that shot over the bow of the Star of the West. My son graduated from that school. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, she graduated from the Citadel Military College of South Carolina. The school at one time would not allow them to come there. It certainly wouldn't allow my daughter to go there. And my son competed in the Star of the West uh, program they have as the best drill cadet, and his name is engraved in granite at the head of the parade field. Twice he won the Star of the West competition. So I was sharing with this man about this, and I said, you know, my son did this, you know, and not only that, he's the commanding officer of a ship, and he is now currently working at the Pentagon, and he is posturing to go and serve as an executive officer of a United States Navy warship, and eventually become the commanding officer of that ship. And uh, we went on his way. I said, and he has an MBA from the Navy Postgraduate School. I said, but you know, in some, some pockets of South Carolina, some pockets of Colleton County where I live, some pockets in the South or some pockets in the United States of America is a young white male in the same age as my son. His teeth could be rotted out from whatever drug he may have been using. He may not have an education at all, but in some of these pockets, that young white male will be treated with greater respect than my son with all of the credentials he has. I said, because that's just the way society is. And what NRCS and the EQIP program and the Center for Areas Property Preservation and similar program, what they're doing, they're merely trying to level the field a little bit. They're not trying to radically do anything. They're saying, hey, let's, let's level the playing field some. And prior to my retirement, I've served as a collateral duty EEO counselor. And I, and I, I, I espouse uh, affirmative action. Affirmative action is not something that I want you to do just because the person is black. I want you to do it because we are trying to, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in the interest of equity, if we have someone who is qualified and capable, yes, bring that person on to offer equity. That's all we are doing. And that's what Garrison Frazier was saying to General William Tecumseh Sherman. Listen, slavery happened. It already happened. Let's move forward. 
we land, give us land, prevent us with land, we will move forward. And then my family and I discovered that, uh, that my wife and I, as we were uh, prospering to retire, I retired in 2014, and you know, my wife basically told me, no, this land is, you don't own this land. And so we started doing the research, went to the Center for Air's Property Preservation and spoke with those folks. And, um, and this, you know, we didn't meet the financial threshold. Uh, you know, we, we guess we made, made, made too much money. I guess in a way, that's a good thing. But, um, but anyway, um, so I said, okay, fine, we need to resolve this. You know, because uh, you know, I, I remember uh, whenever I asked, what prompted you to want to resolve this? Because I remember my dad, you know, I'm 69, and I remember my dad, when I was a young kid, my, my dad with, with, with this, this gentleman on Poco Sabo Plantation, this gentleman rode a horse over, a large bay horse, and I'm looking at the horse, and I'm, a, I'm afraid of the horse. First of all, he's so he's massive. The gentleman riding the horse has a deep voice, and he's a very big man. And, 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 and he said, well, you know, Steve, I think maybe you know, we could join this land back together. I didn't understand what that meant because the, Dr. Thomas Lenning carved this land out of Pocosabo Plantation. This plantation we're on is a part of that plantation. Anyway, uh, my dad would take his hat off in his hand and say, no, sir, Captain, uh, boss, uh, I think we, I don't know what these, he didn't say children, but he said, these, I don't know what my children is going to do with this. So, so what prompted me to want to resolve this, I have two degrees and I'm preparing now to, to study for the LSAT. And I, with my education and my exposure to the world, the minimum I can do is to honor my father and get this thing resolved. So when my wife and I, I was getting ready to retire, I said, let's just resolve this thing. We went to the center. The center could not, we did not qualify financially, but I said, at least let's get everybody to the same table. We had an attorney there, Joshua Walden, a brilliant guy. Uh, he, he, he spoke at length in front of my family and, and assured them that this was really the viable way to go, get this thing resolved. And one of the family members told me, said, Joe, you have more to lose than we do. So you better move on it. So in 2007 to 2010, we started researching and I, I was a federal employee all of my holidays Every on my leave, I would spend researching, going to the Register of Deeds office, uh, poring over old books, going to cemeteries, turning over headstones, talking to a few elderly that still left because we were losing that 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 group, that age group. And so now I'm pouring over this thing, and 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 if time had allowed, would allow, I would have gone into some some details that it was divine intervention, folks. I'm not here the proselyte or anything, but I'm just telling you right now, divine intervention brought us to where we are. To resolve this in three years, to the extent we did, and to walk away and have a productive tree farm today, divine intervention. Now, I, I, when it's all said and done, I'm, I'm grateful to see the, the, the data on the amount of people who are attending. I'm really, really happy for, to see that. But as we, as we were moving forward with this, anyway, this, pro, this land, this plantation, was actually started out at 888 acres. As you come into the main house, we have a, in a map on the wall, which we do tours. We, we have a map on the wall, of pro, prior to COVID anyway, we had a map on the wall to show where Dr. Thomas Lenny actually owned 888 acres. And so, and, so, and so as people are thinking and saying, you know, what happened here now, 888 acres? How did things move forward? What, what, what's the progression of things? Well, as General Schirmer was marching through Georgia, coming to South Carolina, he was basically condemning as he was moving along. And he was doing some very destructive work. He was taking a railroad, rail track rails for the train and bending them between trees and this sort of thing here because he's breaking the back economically. And as, as General Sherman was marching to, to, uh, to South Carolina, the word is, is, is moving ahead of him that this guy is... Is, 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 is wreaking havoc. His march to the end, his famous or infamous, depends on how you look at it, march to the sea. So as he's moving along and, and coming along, landowners are hearing this, they're fleeing. So I have in my possession, not here with me, but in my house, is the, the document from Dr. Thomas Lenning conveying it to one of his slaves. 
And so again, I look at the drama associated with this. He, he, he basically called his trusted slave to him and said, you know what, we, we are, the, the madam and I, or the missus and I, we are preparing to leave. And he said, well, you know, well, well, when are you coming back? And how long are you going to be gone? And this sort of thing. Yeah, because slaves were, were, were very docile people. They, 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 were, they, were, they were broken, not only physically, but broken spiritually in many cases. In fact, you have many people today still broken from that, still broken from that spiritual brokenness. And then, uh, you know, he would, he would question, you see, he said, put the, maybe put the piano in the wagon and put this in the wagon. So he said, well, you know, the slave is looking at this and saying, okay, normally you go, you don't take all this stuff with you. When are you coming back? He said, we're not coming back. We're not coming back. We're not returning. This land is now your land. Now, how do you go from owning, how do you go from being considered property to owning property? And, 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 and no, no doubt, the slave is now staggered and, and he's wondering, what do I do? Who is going to tell me, okay, to, to tend the stables over here, uh, tend the cattle on this side over here? When do we do the planting? He knows how to do it. But he also needed that overseer because that overseer was controlling him all this time. Now he is becoming the owner, he is becoming the worker, and he is now the overseer. And no doubt this person is, 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 is shocked by it because such a, such a quick turnaround, he doesn't have what we called them when I was working in civil service, we had to provide a turnover to another person coming in. If you're coming to relieve me, I need to bring you up to date on something. I need to give you some statistics. Right now, I have a, a situation where all my passwords are located in one spot. I have all this important data. Should I leave this earth unexpectedly and go into that big tree farm in the sky, then again, my wife will be able to go on and move on with life. But see, he didn't have this turnover. And as this person is, is, is I mean, I, in my research, he, he had a wife and he had a daughter and her, her daughter who was born a slave, eventually after, after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, even after Emancipation, he went forward and she married a couple of times and she had a son. And she, her son, um, he married and, uh, uh, one time and did not have children in my research and he was he remarried again and had eight children and mind you having large families was i was telling my wife about it large, having large families like free labor especially when you have boys so this son he has uh three sons and he has uh five daughters and uh one of those sons is speaking before you today i am that son I am that middle son, went away to the military, served my time for four years on active duty, came back, worked 38 years Department of Defense. And I basically retired with 42 years of civil service and never looked back because I am one of those guys. And I've said before in certain uh, audiences, because again, I, I speak before different audiences. If there are audiences sort of in my peer group, I would tell them I would probably not have made a good slave because I'm probably that guy who's going to rebel. Now, I'm not, now, I understand the Bible, the Christian Bible have embraced slavery at one time. There's been slavery from the beginning of time. I understand that. But I'm telling you, there's a natural fire inside of Joseph Hamilton, and I see it in my daughter, Kimberly Hamilton, and I see it in my son, and I, there's a natural fire that says, you know, I want to know what's above the clouds. What that cloud thing up there, what is above that? And one gentleman told me, he said, well, Joseph, you are a restless guy. No, uh, as long as my legs can move, I will move. And so since that time, since I, since I actually, um, and, I, and I took a, took a snapshot of my life since I retired, and I'm a little surprised because I still have a planner. I'm a retired guy, but I have a planner on my desk. I plan things out. And now I am a, I am a member of the Low Country Landowners Association. I was on the, 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 the initial stage where they, they, they set up this association. I was there as a part of the planning committee. And now I'm also chairman of the South Carolina Forestry Commission Advisory Board. 
And I'm also sitting on the Forestry, uh, Forestry Association of South Carolina. I'm a member of the Woodland Operating Committee for the American Forest Foundation. And also I'm a member of the Woodland uh, Community Advocate for the Center for Air's Property Preservation, where I serve as a conduit to get landowners connected with the Center for Air's Property Preservation. I'm a certified tree farmer. I'm wearing my tree farmer cap here. And I'm president of South Carolina, uh, the SS Hamilton Farm, because my dad, when he would take his cap off and he would shuffle his feet, I said, from here on, if you Google SS Hamilton Farm, you're going to hear my dad's name. You're going to hear my mother's name. Because they have done without, so we can be where we are today. And I have family members who still struggle with moving forward. But I owe so much to my parents and my son, who, who has done exceptionally well, and my two daughters, I am so proud of them. I let them know every day, you're standing on my shoulders. I'm standing on Steve Hamilton's shoulders. Steve Hamilton is standing on the shoulders of his mother, who is standing on the shoulder of her father who was a slave and a slave owner handed him the property. And so we cleared the property and the family opted to have it partitioned, which was their right because they had a voice in this as well. I did not want to partition it because the plantation originally with, 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 with uh, Thomas Lenning started out at 888 acres, which as I said, decided to tell you earlier, is on a map as we come into the foyer of the home. And when we cleared the property in 2010, it was 44.4 acres. That being said, then, I've become involved with the Woodland Operating Committee. We go to, the, we, I've been on Capitol Hill for what they call a congressional fly in, and the Sustainable Forestry Land Retention Program is to educate. And when I enrolled in that program, it is to educate landowners, minority landowners, or landowners, period. I've never seen discrimination with the Center for Air's Property Preservation, nor their foresters. And in fact, two foresters who are both Caucasian, they came for my land tour with about 16 youth. They stood right there the entire day and worked with those youth. Afterwards, we invited the 16 youth, the, 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 the five or so adult guests, as well as the two forces into our home. My wife had a, had a meal spread on the same porch. She had the, the meal spread. They would come in, get their food, and this pre-COVID, of course, and go back into the main house and sit. And we fellowship there. And I'll tell you this. We have hosted many functions here, but I've never seen young people, students, this well behaved. And one of the takeaways, this one girl wrote a letter back and said, I will never look at a pine tree the same ever again. So we have accomplished a lot. I want to thank the UGA for inviting me again. I've been, I've actually been to the campus a few years ago, but thanks for having me back here before you again. I'm grateful to be in this audience right now. And, but let me give you this bit of information. You have, you are in for a treat because you have a couple of speakers coming on and I'm not going to take part of the presenter who's doing this, but let me tell you, they have information regarding Ayers property that you really need to walk away from. When you are hearing it, please become enlightened by it. I hope it enlightens you. And then I hope you're enthused by that. And I hope you walk away from this thing empowered to share with others and make a difference. On that note, I'm going to stop because I want to try to stay keep right on time. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thanks, Joe. What an interesting talk. Thanks for all the motivation. I'm pretty sure a lot of landowners who are part of this workshop today, they are definitely motivated. I don't know about others. I am motivated to help more people as much me as can. Right. And I'm very, you know, as always, already we have talked four or five times now. I really appreciate what uh, you are doing, especially getting a law degree to help people like you who live in South Carolina and other states. I really appreciate what you do and what you do is very important. So keep that in mind.
Okay, so I think we have time for one or two questions. I don't see many. Let me take it. Uh, I so do have a slide. I do have a slide, which whenever I present that slide, it is best that I am there because the slide is merely has certain keywords for me to expand upon. It'll, 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 it'll be a tickler, so to speak. For, so if you saw the slide, it was, you will see some words that doesn't mean anything to you. It would mean something to me because it is a, it is a talking point, basically. And my contact information, um, I thought it was presented uh, on the, on the um, UGA. Can, uh, Puneet, you can provide that or you want me to, I'll, 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 I'll put that back up. So my plan is, so I, I'm getting some questions on how to get the slide. So I will write an email to all the speakers get their permission so that I can share all their slides with you, right? So give me one day and I will get back to you very fast on those lines. Sure. Okay. Yeah, as always, the whole idea of this conference is to help people out so that they can seek whatever information they need from all of us and make things move forward, right? So we will help you out. Don't worry, just give us one more day, okay? So with this, thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate what you have talked about, especially straight from your heart and straight from your experiences. I really admire what you do, as always. Okay, so now our next uh, panel is led by Mr. Mark Thomas. Mark Thomas is the Extension Director at Fort Valley State University. And Fort Valley State University is a 1819 land grant of the state of Georgia. And as I told you, over a number of years that I have worked with Mark, we have developed a kind of a special bond and that bond is based on the fact that both of us are motivated by helping others, so which is a strong bond because that is a good thing to do. There is no question mark there. So Mark, uh, I think uh, for next one and a half hours, or what's the time right now? Let me check. Uh, we are running a little late, but that's totally fine. So let it's us not, do one thing. Can you hear me? I, yes. Okay, it's 9.13. Yeah, so 9.13, so, you know, uh, you are in charge now for next one and a half hours, and then we will, or one hour, let's say one hour, 20 minutes, and then we'll break around uh, uh, I got you. 35. Yeah, we'll do our best to keep everybody on schedule. <laughs> Thank uh, you, you man. Know, we've, we've facilitated these a few times, and so I'll do my due diligence to try to keep everybody on task and on schedule. Uh, sometimes it's hard when, when passion gets in the midst of such a very passionate topic, so but we'll do our due diligence. So uh, with that being said, my name is Mark Thomas. Uh, I work at Fort Valley State, and as Panit said, I'll be facilitating this next um, panel discussion. And this is kind of stories from the field. Uh, and it's kind of going in the same vein as what Mr. Hamilton just presented to us. Um, we have four individuals who are going to come and present their perspective as it relates, share their story uh, in terms of air property and property management, some of the trials, tribulations, and things of that nature that they face, that they see kind of just based on them being actual landowners themselves and in some other perspective, uh, people who work with landowners. Um, with that being said, uh, for the most part, we have four speakers. Uh, we're going to start off with Mr. We have the four are Mr. Titus Andrews. Um, he will be presenting to us and I will let him come in his way as he present and give us an introduction. And I believe there is a pamphlet which basically or a uh, schedule that kind of gives an overview of each speaker. So I won't take the time and in lieu of time, we'll kind of move forward. Uh, following uh, Titus Andrews will be, I believe, Miss McClendon. Um, she is a landowner uh, who owns property down in the Dublin area. Uh, next will be, uh, Mr. Homer Bussey, Willie Bussey, he will be bringing a unique perspective from two perspectives as a landowner and also uh, working in the timber industry. And then we have uh, Mr. Mac Evans, who is a landowner from down around uh, in Southwest Georgia. So with that, I believe uh, we will start off with Mr. Andrews. Uh, he has a presentation that he's going to go through. We ask that, as Panit stated, that you put all your questions in um, the Q&A section uh, after each presenter, how this is going to work, we're going to kind of give each presenter an opportunity to basically address a few questions before we go on to the next presenter. And then hopefully at the end, um, as we bring each of the presenters back, you'll be able to put in more questions and answers and we'll get them done as across the board with uh, one of the presenters. Now, I would like to note that we have an array of different experts 
people on this panel with ex different expertise. So if it goes beyond the scope of where we are for this panel, we'll still do our due diligence to rely on the audience and other individuals who we know that are on this conference to get your questions answered. Because it's very important. This is a highly engaging conversation, uh, much needed. So we want to make sure that everybody that is listening uh, is afforded the opportunity to get their questions answered and get the resources that they need. Uh, so with that, I will pause. And again, like I said, I will be facilitating um, this session. And with that, we will start on with Mr. Andrews, who will be sharing his screen. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Good, good morning. I'm Titus Andrews. I'm the county agent for Fall Valley State University. I serve Lawrence, Trutland, Wheeler, Toons, and Jeff Davis counties. For the last 20 years, it has been very rewarding to me to work with landowners to enhance their properties with an area of forestry with long leaf pine. My special is crop, livestock, and dealing with longleaf pines. Here you have a field of soybeans. Let's talk about a crop budget of soybeans. To produce an acre of soybean, it costs $217. At the garden rate, soybean is at $8.25 a bushel. And for dry land, soybean is $30. 30 bushels per acre. You take your total, 247.50 minus $217, you get $30.50 per acre. Remember that because you're going to see this again. I have clients that serve livestock. Let's talk, this is a livestock, but a livestock budget with a 50 cow calf operation. The net return on one cow is $112.08. And on that 50, you got $5,604. Hold that thought, because you're going to see this again. The 15 years. We have planted over 1,376 acres of longleaf pines through the local NRCS and FSA office and participated in the EQIP and the CRP programs. And we do have some clients that are able to plant without the benefit of these programs. There are several list of best management practices out there. But over the years, in the five county service areas that we serve, these are the ones that we have used most. Prescribed burning, brush management, brush management, fire breaks, herbaceous weed control, silver past establishment, and upland wildlife habitat management. Now, we're talking about longleaf pines. I share with you that it has been a pleasure to introduce longleaf pines to my clients and especially to my absentee landowners. I'm going to show you the proof of income on a track of land that has planted through the local NRCS office in the EQIP program. And we're going to use 50 acres of that farm. On years one through seven, we have hunting leases. That 50 acres leasing at $12 per acre gives you $600. We're gonna advance you from eight to 15 years. We still hunt, have the hunting leases. Those 50 acres at $12 an acre, you got $600 an acre. Now, 
We have pie straw leases. It's hard to believe, but in the five county service areas that we're in, pie straw land is leasing $325 an acre. So you got 50 acres at $325. You got $16,250. Now we're thinking long-term. Now we're year 15. We're going to do thinning. We have thinned this 50 acres. We have some pup wood. And that pup wood generated $900 an acre, which could generate a total of $45,000. Let's talk about total income. On those hunting leases, on years one through seven, we got $4,200. Years eight through 15, we got $4,800 for a total of $9,000 in hunting leases. Now we have the pasture lease for eight years for 50 times $325. In eight years, we got $130,000. And that thinning generated us $45,000 in income. And we have a total of $184,000. We know if you're in business, you have expenses. Okay, let's talk about county taxes. We all know we have to pay county taxes. But one of the things that we insure in Lawrence County in the five county service area, we should ensure that all our clients of farms are signed up in the conservation use program. And that is done from January 1st to April 15th of each year. We're talking about the BIMPs, the best management practices. Uh, all the best management practices we use, we have received 60 to 90% cost share rate from the local NRCS office. And of course, when we do things, we do have to pay timber taxes. I took a 35% rate on that, which bring us to $64,400. And we're gonna take that from our total of the first 15 years. That gives us $119,600 which equated out to $7,073 per year. That's not bad. I'm gonna take you a step further. I was there, year 16 to 23. We still have our hunting leases. Those 50 acres generate $12 an acre, which give us a total of $4,200. Also, we do have our pine straw leases. Again, still leasing 50 acres at $325 an acre, which bring us $16,250. In those seven years, we generate $113,750. Now we're ready to clip cut. We got some south timber. We did a thinning seven years ago. Now this cut generated 60 tons an acre, which equates out to 3,000 tons. That 3,000 tons bought us $32 an acre, which generated us $96,000. We had a total of $213,950. Let's talk about our expenses again. We do have the county taxes and we do have the best management practice that we use. And we do have the timber taxes. And again, we had $74,883. That's a little high because we did receive 60 to 90% cost share rates through the local NRCS office. 
Let's give you the summation of those longleaf pines. Years, one through 15, we generate $119,600. Years 16 through 23, we generated $139,067. With a total of $258,000, $667. I want you to note, with the establishment of long lease pine, you can generate passive income throughout the years. 60% or more of your expenses can be received through the local NRCS office, NRCS and FSA office. Here, this is a track land that came out of CRP in 2018. The leases who was leasing this track, they are in the process of trimming up the trees, spreading the land so that you will not have any grass growing in your fields and you will have debris free pine straw. And this same track, pine straw is beginning to be raked. And after this raking, all the limbs will be taken out of the field. It will be sprayed and you will, it will be weed, fit, weed free. At the end of the day, at the end of the week, this is what you're looking, you will receive. On the large track with one of my clients, this is February, come April through June, you're gonna see 79, seven to nine trailers out there and they move in pine straw. And this is an 88 acre track that I'm speaking of. To this is another track from, this is on the McCannon track. This is a half low on this track. Within beginning February, March, you're going to see five to seven trailers on this track. We do have absentee landowners. It has been a pleasure. I'm 95% there. All my absentee landowners, I have been able to convince them to take all of that land out of row crop production, the hay land and put it all in long leaf pines. Earlier, I stated that we have planted over 1,356 acres. This year, we added 112 acres. And this is, again, this is a track that came out of row crop production and were put in the CRP program. This is another track was taken out on Highway 26, another client, absentee land owner. We took this out of row crop production and put it in the CRP. Again, I told you, you will hear this again. What is your choice? Soybeans, 23 years of production at $1,525 a year. You're going to come up with $35,000 and $75. You had operating loans. How many disasters did you occur? Livestock, 23 years, that $5,604, $128,892,000. How many cows did you have in the past? How much additional hay did you buy? How many times did you have to go in and apply for the livestock feed program? And C, long leaf pines. One in 15 years, $119,600. 16 to 23, you got $139,067, which generate a total of $258,667.
What an awesome return on investment. And again, I am thankful my clients are listening to me and I am beginning to, I have advanced their farm with the enhancement of long leaf pine. Thank you for allowing me to present on this virtual conference on AS property and sustainable forest management. All my resources were obtained from the University of Georgia, Department of Agriculture and Applied Economic College of Agriculture and Environmental Science, Crops and Livestock Budgets. If you have any questions, I am here. Mr. Andrews, you have two questions in chat. The first question asked for you to, it was about um, to define thinning. A thinning, okay, when the trees are planted, they are planted at the norm at 705 trees to the acre. And as the tree grows, they grow, grows up and you, it's very tight, tight there. And, and years 15 is you can barely get through that. Uh, you can barely get sunlight. And then usually at year 15, you do thinning. When you do the thinning, that opens up and gives you sunlight for more growth. And it creates a habitat for wildlife habitat management. What's the next question, Mr. Thomas? Uh, the next question was centered around um, the CRP and whether it's five years. No, the CRP is for 10 years. When you sign up for the CRP, it's for 10 years. I have some that uh, we bring out, and when you bring it out of real crop production, we use CRP. And when ones that the planting that was not in CRP, we use the equip program. And with the CRP, you're gonna receive an annual payment for the next 10 years. All right, now you had a question. Um, can cooperative, ex cooperative extension offices, and then they got in parentheses, most states provide an assessment of what their property could produce for passive income opportunities like the one you just mentioned, and then they got in parentheses uh, in Virginia. Okay, it, it based on uh, that the individual, that counter agent dealing with that client, and yes, I know what I do. I do a farm assessment for my clients. Again, yep. this is an assessment of what I do, and all the information that I get, I get it from budgets. And I know with the uh, timber leases, I know what land is leasing for in that area that we serve. Yep. And i like to add a little bit to that. Um, each individual um, state has a land grant institution. Uh, in some states, there are two. Um, as I stated, I work for Fort Valley State University, and we are 1890 land grant. Now, there are only um roughly like 17 states or so that have an 1890 land grant uh institution in there but each state has a 1862 land grant and part of their mission uh is to do outreach and there is a local extension office quite in depending on the populace of that county there is one pretty much in almost every county of every state uh that would be a good resource for you to contact a lot of information as mr andrew stated he worked with uh, NRCS. NRCS is located uh, nationally, uh, as well as FSA. So, and a lot of these uh, agencies have local offices there to serve your county. You just have to kind of identify who those resources are and contact them and go from there and begin that process. But a lot of the services, basically what he kind of presented, it is available to you. Maybe not through one individual as Mr. Andrews just have done it with his clients, but through most of all of the agencies, uh, that is achievable. It's just a matter of contacting the right people in your state. Uh, one other question, and then we have quite a few, and then I'm going to have to go to the next presenter. And as I stated, we will come back to the other questions to get them answered as well at the end. Um, this is one from an anonymous attendee, and it says, Titus, have you seen any risk with not having diversity in enterprises while encouraging pine stands? Restate that, Mr. Thomas, please. It, it says, have you seen any risk 
with with not having diversity in enterprises while encouraging pine stands. In other words, you're you're as you encourage people to put timber up there, have you seen any risk with not having any diversity in the enterprises? Are all the people that you work with do they just do trees or do they do other things as well? Um they have other things going going on. Diversification, yes. But however, as my landowners doing assessment as they get older, I'm asking that them to take their land out of row crop production because stand in Atlanta, stand in Florida, and dealing with a lot of absentee landowners. And as they get older and trying to obtain land uh, operating loans, it, it's getting hard out there. And that's why the question stated on assessments, and that's why I run the numbers. If you do this, this is a good faith estimate what you can receive. And when we do that, it has been a pleasure. I do go in the FSA office and the NRCS office and sign up with them in that program. And one of the things that we always do, if it's a female, we ensure they sign up as a female, a minority, I'm an eliminate resource producer. And over the years, and that's why I stated earlier, 90% of the time we're receiving 60 to 90% cost share rate. And I haven't seen any rigids, and it's been very rewarding in the five county service area that I serve. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Andrews. There are more questions, and we'll come back um, to those questions. Uh, we'd like to transition to our next speaker which i believe is miss charlene mcclendon and miss mcclendon we're going to unmute your mic um panita if you will allow me to share my screen i will just put up just a basic uh overview of miss mcclendon who she is in her brief uh bio as she comes so miss mcclendon if you would just come unmute your mic uh and we will begin to hear your story in terms of any obstacles your challenges uh, with your land management and operation. And I'll, so at this time, Ms. McClendon. So Mark, you can share a screen on your side. Okay. Have you unmuted? You haven't unmuted her yet. Would you unmute her mic, please? Yes, sure, I can. Uh, gosh, where it is here, yeah. So she should get an invitation for unmute. Uh, yes, she should be able to unmute herself. I already asked her. Okay. It's not allowing me to share either. Oh, really? No. Okay, give me a second. Let me do what I can do. Let me make you co-host. Now you should have all the permission, Mark. Thank you. It is still not allowing me to share, but in the interest of time, uh, if we, Ms. Uh, McClendon, are you ready? Okay. Uh, as we work through with Ms. McClendon, uh, we'll skip to Mr. Bussey. Mr. Bussey, are you ready? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, thank you. Sound, thank you for having me today. Can you hear me very well? Yeah, we hear you pretty good. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Good, good. Uh, share my experience in three sides of the story. I can come from one side as being actually in business for myself, was a family business on the air property side, dealing with land owners in the logging business. Also, as been years ago, farmers and now continuing in the logging business and helping the other consulting with friends of mine. 
So we, for years, we had different issues that we dealt with. And I guess I could go back and I have to start back in the, in the 70s as a young man in the logging business and not being logging business, we call it pupboard. And that's where we would be able to go out in the fields and father would actually, someone would contact him and ask him would they be able to come in and cut the timber. He was contracted either to one of the major timber companies or we would sell our timber, to sell the timber they would buy it and we would sell it. And it was just a passion for different ones in, the, in our counties and surrounding counties. If you knew someone that had a public truck, you would ask them to come in and cut timber. This all took place then. It wasn't anything that they just pretty well took the word for it that this is what they come in and contact. And I would use my father as an example. They come in and ask him, will you come and look and see if I got timber to cut? We go in, cut timber. That was no education on looking up, doing a title search, doing a deed, doing a little, none of this stuff. It was just word of mouth. This was the experience that I dealt with coming up. And as we continue to move forward with that, all of a sudden, there was an issue came up. So where some family members came to visit and they found out they had trees cut. And now they want to find out who cut these trees. So as they come in and ask who cut these trees, they contact my father and say, okay, you cut our trees. Ain't nobody said anything to us about them. So how did you come into our property and cut these trees? Well, your brother, he the one had me to come in and cut. So then it started this family, family feud among themselves, which at that time, family respect each other. If one brother was left here, we would say at home and the other one had moved away to the city or whatever, they pretty well has one that oversee it and he pretty well handled everything. They pretty well took words for whatever was did at that time. But as time passed on, generation came and gone and it left it to where now we are at a point to where you have to have legal documents to be able to contact to do all these things today. But as time moved on, then it got to the point where when we go in to do a survey on contract with someone to cut the timber, we found out as I progressed over into the business, I found out I better do a title search and make sure it's a clear deed on this property. Make sure there's no lien on the property. But as friends and different ones coming in, you always take people word for it. And it's time that you took word for it, but you have to always go back and remember, you better be able to go back and do a title search to have sure. Now, in our side of the business today, it's totally different. You never have it to the point to where you know, make sure you have that title, work pulled up, you have a lawyer draw up your paperwork, you go in, I go back to, to uh, different ones that had a presentation this morning, the guy with the account extension, he did a perfect presentation of how this thing worked for us, the logging industry. When it come down to, come down to the logging industry as a whole, we look at how much it takes to operate, how much it takes to cost, and all this education that's there today is available for each and every one to be able to come in and get the education. Education is very important for people today. And we as, 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 as uh, young black entrepreneurs, the one that um, came through and pioneered and opened up the way we have this education here and we have to pass it on to another generation. We have to always talk it to our children, me, myself, being a father, just like back when the other guy, Mr. Joseph, was talking about big family. 
I was a family of nine. Now I have six kids of my own. I'm very proud of them. But the key to the whole thing, always remember to pass it on. Always remember to tell your kids about things you experience, especially if they fall in your footsteps. And I tell anyone anywhere when it comes to dealing with air property, coming back to air property, have your paperwork in order. There's so many in this area, when I come to small town, small community, there's families here that have tied up in air property that have been lost. The property had wind up in probate court to where this property always wind up on the courthouse step. Someone there to buy this property. And it's to the point to where it's just sad that this family always for all these years had this property here and you was always look so this is uh uh far this this fam this family owned this property. This family over here owned this property. But as time move on, now instead of this one family, there's 32 family members, but they all in different places, not in one of areas, and no one acts to take the decision to to, op to come in to manage this property and to take care of it. So it always wind up in our property nine times out of 10. Me being on just small county political side as a commissioner here, it always wind up in our books to where it comes up to where they are missed use or not paid taxes, not wind up on the courthouse step, always that sale on the first Tuesday or whatever Tuesday of the money, whatever county you live in, but it's always wind up on that step. Now it come to the point to where we, as uh, business owners, when we go out and meet with land owners and stuff, and then you find out there's a problem, always kind of educate to me. I always try to educate to let people know, look, these are some things that you need to do. No, uh, never try to get them legal advice. I always tell them, if you need legal advice, contact your attorney. But there's always somebody out there that can help you, to give you information on what you need to do. And all you have to do is just ask. We have perfect, there's so much information nowadays Do our computers do do just a stream of of uh, all kind of knowledge that you can Google by anything you want to know, and you can put it up there here give you an answer to it. It can name whoever you need to contact. You know, yes, yesterday I was sitting here. I said I want some wings. I said, well, I go ahead. I didn't have the number to exactly. I got the number. I'm ready. This day and time, we have access to everything we need right here at Fangertip. All we have to do is apply. For our, for our people in our community now, we advise when you look up air property and you look up this in the south and the owners that wind up in air property, it's just sad to know that we have to know to always be the one that winds up with that air property. That generation to where it's always passed on to another generation. You know, in the political side of it, as a commissioner, we always have to do title search when we get ready to do certain project in our county. And it's it's kind of sad to say, but when we go into a community and say, when we was getting ready to do our sewage and we had to run water lines and sewage lines through the, through the community, to go through some one property, we had to make sure it had a clean title, clean deed and everything. And it was so many of those families that did not know that their property was either had a lien on it or that it was someone had died and didn't leave a will, didn't leave the, in the right perspective to the point to where now here we are having to go through all these different areas to get a clear title so we can finish the project with the sewage or with our water line. That was the political side. Then it came to the point to where me, myself, our family personal side to dad died in 2009, being a family of nine, there was nine of us. 
not it not a being a family and already having a business and having land now we create another problem no problem at all but you have sisters that want to know they want to ask questions so now you have to tell them so we realize we too have to take initiative to establish thing and i you know i just thank god that we have people that can help educate you and tell you what you need to do about taking your land putting it in the right perspective you can always information is very important education is very important all we have to do is tap into the right resources and with this conference it's good to have people here and you can see from the panel that you have people here that know what to do. Me, myself, all I can do is tell you, tap into the right sources. You have each and every one right here that can do whatever you need to do to put you on the right page. You know, being, like I said, being on the property, on the side of the property, being the management, I can go on and on in the logging, what I deal with for landowners, I can go on and on dealing in politics. I've been in commission over 30 years, but just being in all these aspects, dealing with people and having to deal with the things that they have left out. And, you know, a lot of times we look back and we feel so, but we can only look at ourselves, how we handle our own business when it comes to that. What initiative we're taking so my six kids do not have to face what we faced when dad died, or that generation before dad, what they did to prepare. We all need to be prepared now to so that won't happen. Because when it's all said and done, it's gonna wind up left behind. Because when it's all done, we don't see any move towards the cemetery where each and every one is going. So like I said, I can say for air property, for us sustainable. And I go back to our presenter earlier where he was talking about sustainable forest, forest industry. That part is very important. You know, I, I always tell people they come and ask me, we had some timber cut 20 years or 10 years ago. Come and see what we got now. It's sad to say it, but we as people, as a race of people, years ago we all we think was you go cut the trees and come back and you think after 20 years it's just going to grow back up and there it is but no you have to this day and time it's a managing program you have to put in place if you intend to be in the forest industry if you intend to want to be that sustain doing that sustain the fire keeping the farm you know, I look at the presentation the guy did earlier. It was so unique because I think about all the pine straw we could have been bailing up, been making a profit off if we had a, took the initiative, know what to do. Someone had to just educate. We see more and more pine straw out at Walmart at different places now that's being sold, not knowing, but it's an industry out there waiting and booming for so many could tap into you know that's the that's the key to the whole thing knowledge educating let our people know what we have out here what we have our hand on it is valuable to each and every one and how do we do that we pass it on to the next generation we talk about it we tell them about it tell our grandkids about it even if you don't have nothing but a little lawn service tell these kids teach them how to get out there and teach them about lawn service because i've learned that just having a lawn service it could be more one of the more prosperous business making avenues out there this day and time because you find more and more people take pride in their lawn so saying that i say i turn it back over to mr thomas that if had any question like I said, I gave it to my speech. From my experience, education is the very important part. In this day and time, we have everything at our fingertips. All we have to do is just tap into it. It's knowledge out there. So I just thank you, Mr. Thomas. And if anyone have any questions, I'm here to answer.
All right. Thank you, Mr. Bussy. Uh, trying to look to see right now, most of the questions I'm still seeing kind of centered around uh, Mr. Andrew's presentation. Um, but I will ask a couple for myself. Uh, based on your history in terms of working in the logging industry and running a logging company, you touched on the fact that how you all run a title search and the different disputes. Uh, do a lot of people try, if they don't have a clear title in when they're trying to get, just say they timber cut, how does that impact you all and you all's ability to do what you all need to do? Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Going back to the title set, we actually have a forester most of the time that comes in play to do the title search and what we do is go to it and here we'll contact in our area or whoever the company is, they have a person in place they go in and they will do the title search. And then what most of the time, it holds up the progress. If there's a family that actually need money uh, and I would say you have these issues to where there's a family need and have a need right then. Say, for example, just off the bat, there's a family member that died and they're trying to get up money to bed. So here they need money. So most of the time, that company will go ahead and advance them some money up front. They take it. All of a sudden, over the bat, you tied into this company. So now you can also lose on that end because you take a lower price. But most of the time, that forest or whatever, they go do the title search and we contact the lawyer, but it hold up the process when you do not have a clear title on your property. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pete, I, yeah, I see Francis, I see Francis Vaughn has her hand raised and I don't know if I have the ability to get her to ask her question live or not. Do you want to address that? You're on mute, Panique. Yeah, say that again, uh, Mark. I saw someone named Francis Vaughn who had their hand raised. I assume they had a question, uh, and huh. I don't have the ability to unmute them or anything like that. You want to tell them, address how they should answer their question, ask, ask their question? I think it, I don't see any hand from my side unless until there's a mistake here, but uh, I think it will be good for all of us who are attending to write their questions on Q&A. And at this being said, uh, Steve is asking a question on the Q&A option that we got, that other than a lawyer, who else can do a title search? Any idea? And I think this, Mr. Bus, do you all use anybody other than a forester to do the title search? Well, he stated that he they use a forester, correct? No, Mr. Bus? We, the, the forester, the forester, the forester, the, the Forrester East, most all company have uh, their own attorney to come in and do their title search. They have, most companies, they might have two or three different lawyers. It's depending on what area they're in. They use attorney in that area to do the title search if there's an issue. Interesting. Any other questions? And one more time, you touched briefly on issues with uh, uh, individual contacting you about cutting timber and that one individual may not be the sole owner of that property. Have you run into any issues where one individual wants to cut and the other individuals do not? And what's that like for you being on the company side, not necessarily engaged in the family business? Uh, but what kind of challenges that face when the family is not together, but they have all these different individuals and it caught up in their property? Yes, 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 I have, Mr. Thomas. Uh, but in that, say, in cases like that, if it's just tied up in their property, my advice to anyone, do not go out there and touch that tree until all agree. And that got to be a signal until we're all. I don't care if it's not the 10, but if 
just line up to be 30, make sure all 30 have signed off on the dotted line before you make any move toward going towards that property. And you have a question from a Mr. Kenneth Dunn. It's kind of along those same lines. He asks, how do you split the proceeds of a timber sale when there are multiple owners? Now, we we could go with that with several different approaches. And, and I can just go from experience. Once we set up a contract, draw up a contract to do a timber sale, each and every participant in the sale, we don't sign off. And once we give them the contract, we make sure we let them know all proceeds is either going to go to one or if it's five heirs or higher many heirs, we say I tell them exactly how, how much will go to each heirs or what percentage they will be getting. All of them will have to be them agree before we start the cutting and saying that they agree to this is way the proceeds will be taken care of. A, B, C, D, each, each one have to agree to how the money be divided among themselves. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and at this time, um, it is 10.03, so we're going to move on to the next presenter, uh, which will be Mr. Matt Evans. And at this time, we're going to ask Mr. Evans to unmute himself. And as he unmute himself, he will give us uh, his experience, his background in terms of his operation. And I will basically share the screen to basically give a brief bow on Mr. Evans. So at this time, Mr. Evans, if you would introduce yourself to us, sir, and just tell us uh, your story, your background, and your uh, management strategies and what you've experienced uh, since you've been back in Georgia farming. And uh, well, my name is Mac Evans. I'm here in Georgia, uh, Southwest Georgia. And i uh, sitting there and listening to the uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Titus, where you been? I've been looking for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, that mean. Yes, I uh, I moved back and started farming uh, back in uh, 2002. Uh, but uh, where I got started uh, was with air property. Uh, my Father Law and uh, Aka uh, came to me because they had uh, our property. And uh, their sister was the woman that sell out. And they came to me and my, me and my wife and asked oh. us if we would buy her out, they would give us their part. That was back in the early 70s. Uh, uh, we bought her out. And then we had to decide what we what we, what we will do with the property. Uh, so we decided to uh, cut the timber on the property, and after we got the timber cut, uh, we had enough money to pay off the note uh, that we borrowed to get, to get the property, and uh, then we replanted in pines, the lava lovers. Uh, with that, uh, uh, excuse me, but uh, after we planted in, uh, in Lob Lollies and I'll say in, uh, in the middle 90s, uh, they came in and asked us, did we want to sell the timber? I said, okay, we'll sell. And uh, I was selling it for Pugwood. And about two weeks after they was cutting, a guy had called me, the lawyer called me, asked me, and said, Mr. Evans, you have some uh, salt timber. I didn't know what salt timber were. Do you want to sell that? I said, yeah, if, it's, if you could buy it, I'll sell it. And uh, what surprised me was when we got the checks, I looked at one check was uh, Pugwood. Was about sixteen dollars a time. I looked at the other check was salt timber. 
three times as much. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out no, no, what's going wrong. Then uh, after they clear cut it, then uh, we replant it back. And that's where I started to manage my temple. Uh, see, get it thin right. And as it's thinning, I get it, everything taken care of. And uh, then I had to set up a rotation. How should I thin it? Because now I don't want to cut pugwood. I want to cut saw timber. And uh, uh, that's how I got started. And after we started thinning, well, I ran into another problem. We had to compete with uh, sweet on trees, privet, all other undesirable uh, weeds growing up in the trees. And they, and they like in 2000, we came across uh, the word silver pasture. And uh, this, and if you put it in and run cows in there, they would keep your old timber down. They, they would keep the, uh, the weeds and stuff down. So that's how I got started in silver pasture. And I've been trying to manage uh, that uh, since uh, uh, since 2000, and uh, and 2000 we replanted again, and at that time there was 20 acres I we planted in lovely pines, and two years after we planted we uh, ran the cows in there as a summer pasture from 2000 to 2008, no 2012. Uh, but the first uh, eight years, uh, everything was working good. Till one uh, January, I went out there to the Lonely Pines. Didn't know about pine straw. And I tried to figure out why my grades were coming back. It was covered with pine straw. Then I went and talked with the guy about drinking the pine straw. He came and looked at it. He kicked it around. Went back again in his truck. And said, uh, I gave you $100 an acre for 10 years. And I said, okay, I'll call you the next day. But he called me the next morning. He said, do you think about all that thing? I said, yeah. He said, what do you want? I said, what about $200 an acre for two years? He looked at me and said, uh, can you make it five years? I said, 200 for five years? I see if we can go with that. And so that's why uh, we sold uh, uh, pine straw up until uh, 2018. And that's when a uh, uh, friend, Michael, came back. And so now I'm in the process and I'm uh, replanting another six, 60 acres. And I don't know, should I go with long leaf patterns? Should I go with long poly? Should I go with first or third generation? That's something that I is, is dealing with uh, no, at the time. And uh, long leaf patterns, the only thing I can say with long leaf patterns, long leaf patterns is a, a gift that's never stopped giving. Because uh, you break the straw, you don't have to put nothing else on. Next next year, if you go back there, <laughs> destroy there again. It is like uh, like I was telling some of the guys. I said it was a golden goose. I said as long as you take care of it, you have to keep laying the eggs every year for you. And so that's one thing I really love about the long leaf pines. Uh, if there's any questions, then I want to talk to me about, uh, ask me, uh, get in touch with Mark, and uh, no, and he can ask me uh, any of the questions that you would like to you know about uh, my farming. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Uh, we'll research the um, chat and see what we have for you, but I'll just start you off with one real quick. How valuable have uh, just say the different resources that you come in contact with 
um, been to you in sustaining and keeping your property? Just say the different cost share programs that you participated in and the information that you've gotten from extension. How valuable has that been to you as a landowner? Uh, I couldn't have made it without uh, the extension and uh, Poe Valley. Uh, Dr. Latimer, he was the first uh, person came down and talked with me about my, uh, uh, talked with me about the project. Because uh, when I came in, playing long leaf pines, the questions always said, you'll never see a dime, you're too old. You're too old and by the time you get ready to, to clear, uh, to cut your tree, you'll be too old. But they didn't tell me about the amount of money that you can make a pine straw. And uh, that was another part. <laughs> oh, uh, the other program, like uh, 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 USDA, uh, those are some dynamite programs if you use them. Because that's how I got started in silver pasture in uh, 2000. Uh, my son was working, uh, no, my son was in college and he was doing an internship at uh, USDA in Atlanta. And I think the guy he was working on then was Mr. Adams. And I told Mr. Adams about uh, no going in the silver pasture. And uh, they, uh, that was when I first got my uh, grant to help me with the, uh, no putting the wells in, putting the fence up. It was, it was an excellent program. It still is an excellent program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Mack, one other question, uh, and then we'll kind of move on in the interest of time, make sure, because we have several different questions that are still kind of left out there. Briefly, could you just explain to individuals when you say civil pasture, some of us are familiar with what that is, but for some people that may not, would you just kind of explain to them when you say you run civil pasture, what that means? Uh, uh, what that means uh, that you have uh, trees that you thin out, you go in there, you plant uh, a, a shade tolerant grass, uh, like that here in Southwest Georgia, it's for hair grass. We plant for hair grass uh, in, in the trees up to get them them out. And uh, then you, uh, you, run, uh, you run your cows and that. You know, just like a regular a pasture, but it's uh, uh, in the, what they call it, in the woods. But uh, this is an excellent program. All right. And one other question that just came in from a Mr. Kenneth Dunn. Uh, and he asked, what benefits did you get from Silver Pasture? It's a two-part question. And does incorporating timber into cattle, can, into cattle management have any positive effects? Uh, yes, one positive effect. Uh, your cows is always in shape. Uh, your cows always keep your keep the timber fertilized for, for maximum growth. Uh, that's what most people don't, don't realize. Uh, There's a, a whole list of it. Uh, the, the biggest one is your cows are always in shape. They always keep the privet, the sweet gum, the other species from coming up, competing with your trees. and your trees, to me, they grow twice as fast. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mack. There are a few other questions, I think, from uh, all the different uh, panelists, but we want to make sure uh, I see Ms. McClendon is back, uh, and I see there's a few technical issues that we're working on with her sound. Uh, is that been worked out, or are we still having difficulty with her and her ability to hear? I see she's unmuted from what I see on my end. Yes, Mark, we have some issues. I don't know what. I think the issue, whatever difficulties are, that is on her end because, as you know, we are running smoothly from last two hours or so. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, Mr. Andrews worked with Ms. McClendon. So, Mr. Andrews, if you unmute yourself and give us kind of a 
brief overview of your working and dealing and background on Ms. McClendon in terms of her story, her background. Thank you. Sure, sure I will, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Ms. McClendon, uh, I've been working with uh, their family for the last 20 plus years. And Ms. McClendon's parents, mother and father, they come from uh, large landowners on both sides of the families. And her parents has passed and she uh, obtained two tracts of land, one from her uh, mother's side and one from her father's side. And, and it's all clear. And dealing with Miss McClendon, I was able to plant both tracts in longleaf pine. And we received the 90% cow share rate. And dealing with Miss McClendon, what was so good about it, the farsher, the, the who was planting the, group that was planting the trees, they was already in another area. And I asked them, I showed them what she has been approved for. And I asked them, were you planted for this? And they said, yes. So basically we have enhanced her property and she didn't come out of her pocket with any money. It was just time and effort. And that's been over eight, over 10 years ago now. We have hunting leases on Miss McClendon's uh, farms. And now we are putting it out there and uh, we have two companies has bid on it to get the pine straw lease on it. And all this is in, in long leaf pine. So that's gonna be very rewarding to her again, as I stated with my other clients. She gonna have the timber lease. She gonna have, I'm sorry, she gonna have the pine straw lease and hunting leasing. And she gonna have two means of income from that farm. And she regenerated all program benefits. And I think it's a win-win. I know it's a win-win situation with Ms. McClendon. She is an absentee landowner. And that's what we have done over the years for Ms. McClendon and our other absentee landowners. Uh, quick question for you as it relates to Miss McClendon. Is she kind of the, I noticed you said she inherited property from both sides of her family, her uh, mother and her father. Is she kind of sole proprietor or does the property that you help her manage, is, is it in with, in with other siblings? I, I love it. That, thanks God to their parents. Before other past, it was, it was surveyed and split up. It's her. Each sibling have their own track. So based on what you're saying, her parents probably did their due diligence in estate planning and deeded her property to, to her and not necessarily deeded to all of them in cooperation, correct? Right. The 150, both 156 EZs on her phone is in Miss McClendon's name, not the other siblings. Again, the other siblings have their own farm. They have their own track number, farm number. All right. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I am going to basically see if we can address uh, some of the other questions that we have in the Q&A part and in the chat section. And I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure I address it to uh, who I believe the panelists in which they are talking to uh, with those questions. Uh, we have one question from Veronica McClendon, and I believe this is to you, Mr. Bussey. Uh, it asks, how do loggers deal with unknown heirs and distributing money? Now, I believe you touched on how money is distributed and kind of distributed based on uh, the contract. But I guess more importantly, I don't know if you addressed a situation where the heirs are unknown. How do y'all deal with unknown heirs? If you all, if there are some heirs out there that you all are unaware of, based on the title search, once the I have to have to go back to a situation where we have one case that where the attorney did all his due diligence, he did everything he could to know, notify each heirs. He went to each heirs that was involved in it and made sure they didn't know of any unclosed air but in the same case it could be that case that there's someone that'll pop up after the fact and if they popped up after the fact 
but you make the attorney had to take it, all the paperwork that he needed to do to clear them up. And then that family made an agreement to saying that, look, if it come up after the fact, we will deal with it. We have the money. So that was one case that I dealt with. But thank God we didn't have any pop up after that. But it's all cases that do pop up like that. Um, and I, I guess um, from this perspective, I guess the one of the important highlights of this is to ensure that if you are getting ready to uh, sell, you should make sure you have the expert expertise at your disposal, meaning consulting foresters who are working with you on your uh, timber selling and also attorneys at your disposal too. Um, because in some cases, I would say that there may be some unknown heirs, meaning children, that all family members may not uh, be aware of. And that may be a sensitive subject. It is a reality of having um, children who were outside of the marriage to which heirs may not be aware of. And then once a death takes place, uh, those heirs come forward. Uh, That's correct. Okay. Thank you. From C.W. Lewis, uh, and it's as from the beginning interest in purchasing land to propagating longleaf, and I imagine this is to you, Mr. What is the model? What is the model for minimum acreage? Uh, I assume if you're planning, they ha asking a question. What would you recommend the minimum number of acres be if they were going to convert into longleaf, based on your experience? Who is that to? Uh, Mr. Andrews. So, uh, I strongly recommend to start at a minimum of, of 25. And the reason I said 25, you got to look at loggers. When they come, when that time to cut or thin, is it going to be worth their while to bring all their equipment to come in and set up? Okay. And to follow up with that, Mr. Busty, since Mr. Andrews miss, mentioned loggers, how what's your take on that in terms of do you all want to see a minimum acreage when you're coming in? Cut does acreage is a determining factor whether y'all come in and cut or not? The size of operation. Yes, it do matter. The size of the operation. There's and sadly to say. There's no more short trucks that come in and cut the five and 10, a 10 acres anymore. A lot of the, in the industry now, they look for a minimum of 50 plus to either move their equipment in, to either start looking at cutting. That's it, now it's special. And I use the case to where you have an adjoining landowner next to a landowner to where if you wanna cut, that is time to cut. But to have to uh, move from 20 mile to 30 mile down the road to cut 50 acres or uh, less than 50 acres is not feasible for the loggers itself. All right. Thank you. Uh, there was one question that asked what is civil pastor? I believe Mr. Evans addressed that uh, question. And this is a question to the general panel, to everybody. Uh, is do you benefit from disaster programs? And I guess we'll start off with that question with you, Mr. Andrews. What was that question to Mark? Uh, that was to probably you. It asked, uh, do you benefit from disaster programs? Do I benefit from disaster? I believe yes, it's asking it like, it, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. We do benefit from disaster programs, even in the forestry industry, over in the pine trees, you have the tap. And that has happened in the early years, which is the tree assistance program. And not only that, you get a tax write off on the depreciation of that. When Hurricane Michael came through, and I think it's in 2018, a lot of trees were damaged. And the governor put their things up put in place and you can re receive a depreciation because you suffered a severe loss. 
and there are disaster programs for that. And we do participate in disaster programs. When I say we, I'm speaking of the clients that I serve. Okay. All right. Um, there's a question, and it's the general. Is uh, did I miss the answer for the minimum amount of air property to conduct forestry, and does it differ from state to state? Now, I assume this question is pretty much asking if you in air property, is there a minimum amount for, let's just say, to come out and have to participate in some programs? Um, a brief answer to some of that, and I'll pause and let allow others to answer too. Um, USDA pretty much for any of its cost share programs require a minimum of 10 acres in order to participate. Um, like if you was going to participate in the CRP program or any of those programs, it, it has a minimum requirement of 10 acres uh, to participate. But as Mr. Bussey and Mr. Andrew stated, um, small acreages are, it impacts the ability if you do get ready to sell and or cut your timber or selling your timber, uh, it will have an impact on, on obtaining a logger. And what Mr. Bussey said, based on, you know, the day and time, what we used to refer to as putwood, putwaters, people with uh, short truck, one, two man crews, uh, those are pretty much obsolete now. And you have big operations coming in and those operations have costs. Uh, and so those costs have to be a consideration. Um, it is a business. If a person feels that from their standpoint that they aren't going to recoup the money or it isn't worth their time, energy, and their expenses, then they aren't going to go with that. Logging companies are in business to make money, and, and the only way to ensure that they make money, the size of the operation is a consideration. Now, one of the things that was Mr. Bussey stated that could help mitigate that is to possibly look at people in your area. If you are a small uh, landowner, um, look in your area to see if other individuals within your area are interested in selling. And if so, if you all could kind of pool together and that person uh, is willing to come in and look at all them different tracts of land to see if it's advantageous to them to come in based on a pooling of all of those individuals. Now, that doesn't mean you all sell y'all timber together. It just means you all are selling at the same time and that, that location is right there. Uh, and they can easily go from your property to your neighbor's property and so forth and so on. Um, but and so, but with that said, that's pretty much in with that USDA minimum that is across the board. Uh, USDA is a federal agency. Those agencies are federal. So the same would apply from um, state to state. But in terms of uh, state requirements for state programs, then that minimum acreage or number of, to participate in a program could vary. Uh, uh, sorry to intervene. I think we have five more minutes just to keep everything in check. Okay. All right. We can take a few more questions. Uh, Mr. Andrew, someone is asking about uh, absentee land, absentee owner. Does being an absentee owner diminish your ability to qualify for program support, meaning participating in USDA programs? No, no, it does not. None whatsoever. Once you come in and certify your farm, you have a 156EZ, which is your farm records. You can sign up for any program. You can sign up for the equip. If it's row crop production, you can bring it out of row crop production and put it in CRP. You plant your trees and you can stay where you are. And I have several Several absentee landowners, they participate in programs without any hesitation, reservations, and they receive benefits, and it's very rewarding to them. And I enjoy assisting them. I have absentee landowners that stays in Florida and North Carolina. I talk to them quite often, but they usually come in twice a year, and we meet at that time. And at that time, we make farm visits. And anything they need or issues, they have my telephone number. They call me, text me, or email me. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and just to read some of the comments, um, someone put it in the chat about having seven acres, I believe, in Arkansas. Uh, and they echoed the sentiment. They basically saying that, you know, timber harvesting has been a challenge. Uh, and that's just due to the near size of that. And someone also made a comment that landowners with smaller holdings sometimes join together uh, with other neighbors, neighboring landowners to make it worth the while for the larvae to come out, as we have also echoed in here. Um, and I believe, make sure I have all, I believe, uh, oh, well, let's answer this question. Mr. Andrew, someone asked about in going on with absentee farmer's role. They asked, uh, as in explain the absentee farmer's role, which I think you've done, but they ask, do they pay a fee for that person who manages their land? And I think people want to know, uh, you, you're you working with these individual landowners, uh, and so what do they owe you? <laughs> what do they owe you? So if you would clarify that, please, sir. <laughs> Again, make, make sure we have a clear understanding. I work for Fort Valley State University, and I don't manage that farm. They have farm managers, they have people coming out doing work. What I do is provide technical assistance to them. And it is established, and I tell them that based on my job, if I make one farm visit, if I make 10 farm visits a month, it does not cost you anything. There is never, I say never, any money passed between a client, a landowner, and myself. We don't do that. And like I said, there is extension in every state and pretty much offered in every county, um, whether it's through an 1890 or an 1862, like here in Georgia, it is Fort Valley State University and University of Georgia. Uh, University of Georgia operates in all 159 counties. Uh, Fort Valley, we are, from a county standpoint, we operate in roughly 30 uh, of counties. Uh, and all of those are not necessarily agricultural counties that we operate programs out of either. Um, in the interest of time, moving on, I do want to make sure we get these last few questions answered. Uh, Mr. Andrews, could you briefly explain, someone asked about the definition of an absentee landowner, and they said, does that simply mean they don't live on the land, or is, or is it something else? What I call, for my absentee landowners, they don't live in the county. I, they, don't, they, they do not live in the county. Some of them live in Atlanta. Some of them live in South Georgia. Some of them live out of the state. Got several live out of the state. Yeah. That yeah, is my definition of an absentee landowner. Okay. And that, that may vary. I, I, because, you know, initially, absentee landowners are individuals who are not there and readily accessible to go out and view their land, whether that be distance or in some cases, it could be some type of medical history that prevents them from going out to be able to physically able to go out and look at their property and view it. Uh, so, you know, there are a bunch of different scenarios, but it's basically is a person who isn't readily available to go to their property to continuously check up on it. Uh, one other question as it relates, we're getting a lot on absentee landowners. Mr. Thomas, um, may I make one more one comment, please? If you add it to this, let me give you this question and then you can add it before this and answer this question too because it's in line with absentee landowners. Okay. Uh, with, someone asked, with absentee landowners, is there anything that they could do to prevent squatters from claiming any portion of their property? And that's kind of a legal issue, but we'll let you go ahead and uh, let you uh, speak on <laughs> if you know of a few strategies that people can incorporate. No, I, I don't, I haven't experienced that, but for a squatters, the best thing I advise you to do, make sure you, as one of the presenters, Mr. Buss has stated, make sure you have your land is surveyed, make sure you know where your points are. And starting off in the early years, that making uh, visiting landowners, well, where's your point? How many acres do you know where your points are? Or, or no, and it is very important that you know what each one of your points so no one can come across on you 
uh, cut timber or rake pine straw. And again, my absentee landowners, we don't have that problem. And one thing I want to say about my absentee landowners, all my la absentee landowners are in the timber slash forestry slash pine straw industry. None of my absentee landowners are in the row crop or livestock business. All the ones that are in the livestock and row crop business, they live on the farm. Okay, Mark, I think we are running out of time now. Okay. Okay. So just I want to add one more thing before we close it down. So thank you so much for all of you. I appreciate your time and honest uh, experiences that you have shared with everybody. I definitely like to thank Mr. Mac Evans. He has also helped us a lot in terms of doing some good research. So Mac, I really appreciate all your time that you have given to us and especially talking to Noah when he visited your space. I think he said you're welcome. Okay, oh sure, thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, thank you. And I, and I would like to, I know we did probably, uh, there were a few questions that we didn't maybe get to. Um, maybe they we, there'll be a later panel um, that's gonna kind of be discussing what's next. And some of your questions uh, may can come up in uh, that panel uh, discussion, if we didn't get your questions answered, we thank you for asking these questions and we apologize if we didn't get a chance to get to all your questions. And this being said, uh, you know, question and answers are there. If panel members have time, they can reply them in writing. So that should not be a problem. Yep, I think there was one question about the speaker's presentation. Is there a way that you will be sharing that or will, that, will those presentations be available for people to look at at a later date? And so could you touch on that before oh, we sure. move on? So the plan is definitely we are going to share all the recordings that we are doing, so do not worry about them. You will have whatever we have discussed in one form or another. But I think uh, presentations are always handy because you will want to see a one hour video or so. So I will ask all the speakers to get their permission first before I share them with you or an email. But I'm pretty sure all the speakers will agree to share their presentations. And if they do, you will get it in one week or so. And after three or four weeks, we will also upload video and we will let you know where those videos are available so that you can go and watch. Okay, thank you. Well, that concludes our panel discussion. Um, again, thank you all um, for your questions. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, panelists, uh, Mr. Andrews, Mr. Bussey, Mr. Evans, uh, for their participation and sharing of their knowledge. Um, as we all know, air property um, and estate planning is a uh, critical issue, especially as you sustain and manage your farm. Um, one thing Mr. Andrews alluded to in terms of touched on um, some of his clients and the age, um, you know, at some point land is going to transfer. Uh, and when it transferred, the success of that is how it's transferred and who it will be transferred. Uh, Mr. Bussey touched on the next generation and educating um, the younger generation as to what you have. Um, I encourage each of you to do that, and there isn't uh, such thing as too early. I believe the earlier you get them into it, the better. Uh, in order for kids to have a connection to the land, that is our responsibility to give them that connection to the land. But if we never talk about it with them, then unfortunately they aren't going to have that connection to the land. And then one of the things that may come up is, well, let's sell it. I, this is just a place that I went to, especially as they grew up in different urban areas. So we encourage you all to uh, continue to educate and talk uh, about your property and make sure you do your due diligence by way of the resources that are available to you to take advantage of proper estate planning and also timber and farm management to sustain your operation. So with that, thank you, Panit. We appreciate it, this opportunity, and we turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate all of your time and definitely thanks for moderating this panel. I think it was very helpful to understand where these landowners are coming from and what are the issues that they have faced and basically how they have overcome all those things. And there are so many opportunities that people can avail if they have legal title and of course, if they're doing sustainable forestry. So thank you everybody. Thanks again. So time is 10.41 or 10.40. Let us take a break of 10 minutes and then we will come back at 10.50. And then we are going into the second session.
is basically talking about the, all the research that we have done as a part of this SARE grant. And uh, after that, uh, Jim Babin Datto will come and talk about air property on Indian lands. Because if you think air property is complicated, then think about air property on Indian lands. So that is what Jim is going to talk about. I still don't see him here, but I'm pretty sure he is going to join us soon. So with this, let us take a break of 10 minutes and those, uh, and come back at uh, 10.50. In the meantime, if you are looking for credits, do not shut down your Zoom session because then we will lose track of you when you log in and all those things, right? So otherwise, let us meet at 10.50. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>